For the last few weeks, I've been testing the MacBook Air on M2, and I also compared it with the MacBook Pro on M1 and MacBook Air on M1. And finally, I'm ready to tell in which case you'd better go with this or that machine. I won't be showing any benchmarks here, I personally don't find them informative, but I did some measurements by myself, and that is something that might be useful to you. It's Alex here, welcome to the Geek's Table, and let's start our MacBook comparison. So first of all, if you're moving from an Intel machine, you'll be amazed how power efficient these laptops are. You don't have to think about charging at all. This is an online playback test. The screen is on its maximum and I'm watching a 4K video streaming online. That's just mind-blowing and MacBook Pro could live even a bit longer than others because it has active cooling system. Alright, so all laptops are dead now, so we obviously need to charge them. But which of these chargers should we use? MacBook Air on M1 comes with a 30 watt charger and it goes from 1 to 100 in 2 hours and 18 minutes. You may buy an extra brick for 67 watt and it will charge it almost half an hour faster. I've also tested it with a 130 watt adapter that comes with a 16 inch MacBook Pro and it was nearly the same result. MacBook Pro on M1 comes with a 67 watt charger and you get from 1 to 100 in 2 hours and 2 minutes. Funny enough, but a 130 watt charger made it in 2 hours and 6 minutes. When you buy the MacBook Air on M2, you have three options. The 30 watt charger brick, the 35 charger brick that has dual ports, and the 67 watt charger brick that promises the fast charging. Also, you have two ways to charge your laptop, via MagSafe cable or via USB-C cable. So here things become more interesting. When charging with a default 30 watt charger with a MagSafe, the laptop goes from 1 to 100 in 2 hours and 26 minutes. Once you switch to the USB-C with the same charger brick, it's the same 2 hours and 26 minutes. When charging with a 35 watt brick, you save up to half an hour. And for some reason, MagSafe was slower in this case. Then I tried charging a dead iPhone 13 Pro along with the MacBook Air on M2 via this dual port charger. The charging time increased dramatically. When charging both devices, each port of this charger was outputting around 17 watt each, so none of the devices was able to get more power than the other one. And afterwards, I charged the MacBook Air on M2 with a 67 watt and 130 watt chargers. And well, you can see the results yourself. So it seems that the 67 watt charger is the one to go with, but I think I'll do an additional round of tests for it. Now let's briefly talk about the design of the new MacBook Air. You may like it, you may hate it, it's purely personal, but anyways, this is the direction Apple have chosen. We can support it by buying this device or go another way. If we treat it as a standalone device without any legacy, it feels really well built and very light in hand. Well, not a feather, not air, but just a very light laptop. Compared to the previous Air, it's thinner than its thickest part and thicker than its thinnest part. Oh, and it's much thinner than the 16-inch MacBook Pro, of course. If you look from above, then all three laptops are almost identical. Good thing, the new square design allows to put more batteries inside, so theoretically the laptop can live longer. Bad thing, the base is really thin, so Apple haven't given us any extra ports, well, just the MagSafe. You still have two Thunderbolt 4 ports on one side, plus MagSafe, and an audio jack on the other side. They could have squeezed the SD card slot somewhere here inside, but then guess what? People would start using these accessories again, to get more storage for less money. And Apple doesn't like when you save money, you know? The bottom part is clean, no MacBook Air engraving compared to the latest MacBook Pro's new design. The keyboard has the same layout and the buttons share the same shape. But the aluminum between them is not black and it preserves the color of the case. Oh, and the holes of the speakers on the sides of the keyboard, they are completely gone. If you like the touch bar as much as I do, then the MacBook Pro 13 inch is the only choice these days. And I have two apps that may improve your experience with a touch bar. The app called Haptic Key can make your trackpad vibrate whenever you touch the touch bar. 
or make the screen blink as well to make it more visible. And with the POC app, you can turn your touch bar into the dock, so you can save a bit of the screen area. The links will be in the description and they are not affiliated, so I'm just sharing my daily experiences here. Now back to the keyboard. The Touch ID works fine across all three laptops, it's basically instant, so no differences here. Oh, and some of you, my dear subscribers, like when I include the sound comparison. So here is how the keyboard sound. Finalizing the design review, I should say that the black version of the MacBook Air collects all possible fingerprints, so think twice before buying it. And also, a weird thing happened to me. So Apple removed the MacBook Air title from under the screen and made the laptop literally black. So when it's opened, it really looks like some PC laptop because MacBooks haven't been black for decades. Maybe it's just me, I, I don't know. Anyways, I do recommend the silver option because it never disappoints. Now let's talk about the M2 for a little bit. So M1 was a great success that I personally wasn't expecting. Power efficient, blazing fast, great CPU. But as any first generation of a product, it had some limitations. You know, when you want to deliver a product as soon as possible, you start cutting edges here and there. And basically, this is how software development works. So the first thing that I was expecting from M2 was an improvement on external SSD support. These are the read and write speeds of my Samsung drives T3, T5, T7 and X5 on an Intel MacBook Pro. And here are the speeds on M1 MacBook Air. You can definitely see the difference, can't you? And now here are the measures for the M2. As we can see, Apple did fix the write speeds of most of the drives, but the read speeds are still far from the Intel values. In daily usage, you probably won't notice it, but the fact that they haven't fixed it in the second generation makes me disappointed a bit. Oh, and yeah, just for the record, I have the base version of the MacBook Air on M2, and it has the slower internal SSD compared to the base versions of the other two laptops. But moving on, the next thing I was expecting from M2 was a two display support. And guess what? I'm connecting two 4K screens and it supports just one. Again. And even when you close the laptop and the internal screen goes off, obviously, it still cannot handle two external screens, which is quite odd. However, it can actually support an extra screen if it's your iPad in the sidecar mode. In this configuration, I was finally able to have three screens and probably an average MacBook Air user won't need it, but hey. You're watching the Geeks table after all. And by the way, this is the stand that I used in the previous shot. It's made by the company called MagFit. And well, they didn't sponsor this video, but I thought, well, if it's a good product, then I will share my experience with you. And I think it's a good one, especially if you have a tablet and a laptop with just two ports. So it's a magnetic stand for an iPad with a dock station in its base. It features an HDMI, Ethernet, three USB-A ports, an audio jack, and a card reader. So you can use it either with a USB-C powered iPad or with a MacBook that is nearby. It can also charge your device at the same time when it's plugged to the electricity via the USB-C port on the back. The stand is made of metal and it's very stable given that it's a 12.9 inch iPad Pro and it supports rotation and multiple angles. Well, just know your limits. The only downside that I found was the necessity of using the case that comes with a dock because it has the necessary magnets. It's a nice case, but it doesn't protect the screen and also this top part looks kind of weird. But otherwise, it's a great accessory for home and office and it may improve your experience when using a MacBook with just two Thunderbolt ports and an iPad. The link will be in the description. Okay, so let's finalize it with the M2. The performance. Does it throttle without a fan? Is it better than M1? So here are the experiments that I did. 
I used LumaFusion for rendering two of my videos. They have some filters, cropping, transitions, and so on. And by the way, if you have LumaFusion on your iPhone or iPad, you can install it on M1 or M2 machine and try it out. Funny enough, in one case, the MacBook Air on M2 was 20 seconds faster, but in the second one, all three laptops did it at the same exact time, which proves once again that M1 is really a great chip. I also decided to put the CPU and GPU under pressure and convert five video files to MP4, H.265, 10-bit HDR files. I took the handbrake converter, which is now optimized for the Apple Silicon, and started my measurements. If I look at the time that took M1 machines to compare the conversion, we'll see how important is the fan in the MacBook Pro. It was able to keep the CPU cooler and it wasn't throttling as in the MacBook Air. However, if we look at the MacBook Air on M2, we'll see how it's much closer to the MacBook Pro on M1, and that's quite impressive. It would obviously consume more energy, but still keep in mind that it's a fanless machine. As a software developer, I also gave it a try with the latest Android Studio, which is optimized for M1 and M2. And people who watched my Android videos know that I usually do the following. So I invalidate the caches and restart the Android Studio for 10 times. Then for 10 times again, I do some simple code changes here and there to emulate like debugging work and also deploy on a device 10 times. And finally, also for 10 times, I do some simple UI changes in the XMLs and deploy it on a device as well. My project is relatively big. It has a dozen of modules with lots of libraries, but even so, the speeds are amazing compared to the Intel speeds that I used to have before. Debugging is also great, and I've noticed how the times started slowly going up on the M1 Air, but on M1 Pro and M2 Air, they remained more or less the same. And with the XML, I was again reminded that the chips are quite close to each other because the average compile time was the same across all three machines. So yeah, M2 is slightly more powerful. It does throttle without a fan, but the performance is quite close to the M1 with a fan. All right, I think we're done with the CPU and now it's time to check some essentials. The screen on MacBook Air on M2 is slightly bigger, though it has this weird notch on the top. As a 16-inch MacBook Pro user, I can say it doesn't bother me, but it still looks odd. If they had Face ID there, that would have made more sense. MacBook Pro on M1 and MacBook Air on M2 feature 500 nits of brightness, where the MacBook Air on M1 features 400. In daily life, you'll probably won't see the difference, but on a sunny weather, you might want a brighter screen. Some reviewers made me smile when they said that the MacBook Air on M2 has a dramatically bigger screen than the MacBook Air on M1. To me, that's not much of a difference, actually. So I decided to open a few apps and compare the space that I get on both of these laptops. Have a look. Pixelmator. Android Studio. VS Code. Final Cut. DaVinci Resolve. Capture One. Safari, and watching the videos. In fact, when watching the videos, the black area on top and bottom will be wider. So I do still like the screen of the MacBook Pro. Now let's check the web camera. Okay, so this is the web camera test. We have a MacBook Pro, MacBook Air on M1, and MacBook Air on M2. And I'm really curious about your thoughts because, well, it's very subjective. To me, they look quite same, to be honest. I mean, well, maybe MacBook Air and M2 have a sharper image because it has a bigger sensor, but I usually talk on Skype and Zoom and I don't have a very good internet connection, to be honest, and the image that my the people I'm talking to, they get, it's usually same. So let me put the blinds up so we'll see how this web camera manages when the conditions are not so well. Okay, so now I have the blinds and I'm not sure if you can tell, but we have relatively small amount of light coming into the room. And just by looking at the image right now, I can already see that MacBook Air on M2 with a bigger sensor has a better image. So less noise, it's more natural looking. So the M1 family has 
the noticeable noise, at least on my t-shirt, and also it makes the image more bright than it is. So yeah, well, I think they did a good job in a low light condition. So after watching the samples, I do prefer the quality of the Air on M2, though the Air on M1 was more color accurate. But as I usually say, who cares about the white balance on a webcam anyway? Okay, now let's check the microphones of these devices. Okay, so this is the test of the microphones of the laptops. I'm standing just in front of them on a distance that you would normally use, maybe like 20, 25 centimeters. So probably this is the quality that you will normally get when working with your laptop. Now let me go on a bit of a distance in case you have a meeting. So now I will be two steps away from the laptop. So this is kind of the quality that you might get when you're having a meeting and you're recording it. So you have many participants standing or sitting in front of you and also now I'm moving behind the laptop. So if you have an interview with a candidate, which you also might want to be recorded. So this is the quality that you will get from the candidate who are you, who you are talking to. Now, let me open the window. We have quite a busy street there. And now I'm back to the laptops. So let's see how the noise canceling works. Yeah, I hope you will not hear much of the noise of the traffic that we have there, but who knows? Well, so yeah, this is the quality that you will get from the microphones of three laptops. I hope this will help you to decide. To me, the M1 Air was the worst and M1 Pro was a tiny bit better than M2 Air, but anyway, they all do a bad job cancelling the external sound, so if you wish to record anything with these microphones, consider a silent room with no extra noise. And here we are again with our usual dilemma, which laptop to buy? If I were to choose just between these models, I would go with the MacBook Pro 13-inch, 16 gigabytes of RAM and half a terabyte of storage. I do think that this is the best value that you can get for this price range. Also, you might find a good deal in a refurbished market or just on some sale in some electronic store. So this machine won't throttle, it will give you a great screen, long battery life, best power brick and loud speakers. MacBook Air on M1. Well, compared to the MacBook Pro, it's full of compromises. So no fan, the screen is less bright, smaller power brick, less performance. But it has this iconic design and you may find it for a really affordable price. So if you're on a really tight budget, I mean like extra hundred of dollars or euro is a big deal for you, then go with this machine. If we won't look at these guys here, it's a great machine for basic and intermediate tasks. Just please go with at least half a terabyte of storage and eight cores of GPU. And finally, the MacBook Air on M2. In my score, it's very close to the MacBook Pro actually, and I'm pretty sure that for some of you, after watching all this review, this is the winner of today's competition. If you value the new design, better web camera, the MagSafe, and you can afford the half a terabyte version, go for it. Basically, we ended up with a budget solution, the MacBook Air on M1, the best value for the money, the MacBook Pro on M1, and for those who have some extra cash, the MacBook Air on M2. I hope this was useful, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the comments, I'd be glad to answer them. It's been Alex, and see you at the Geek's Table. Bye-bye.